You're listening to the OIST podcast, bringing you the latest in science and tech from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University. My name is Andrew Scott. It's a rare treat to be able to share this interview with one of the most engaging mathematicians around today. Tadashi Tokieda is currently a professor in the Department of Mathematics at Stanford University in the United States, but he started his fascinating career as a painter in Japan. He then moved on to France to study philology, and by the early 90s he'd earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Oxford University and a PhD from Princeton a few years later. Professor Tokieda visited Oist at the start of November, where he gave an excellent talk about the strange physical properties of a collection of otherwise everyday-looking objects. As an example of informative and entertaining science communication, his lectures are well worth seeking out. Or failing that, his collaborations with the YouTube channel Numberphile. If you are looking to spark a bit of fascination with the world, you won't go disappointed viewing them. I sat down with Professor Tokieda after his lecture for an enthralling chat that would take in mathematics, child prodigies, and how language frames science, amongst many other subjects. I hope you enjoy it. Can you tell me a little bit about the lecture that you gave us? Oh, um, I'm not going to tell you anything about the lecture that I gave you for the good reason, and in fact this is an important point, that you see... It's like telling the punchline of a joke and then trying to explain the joke without actually telling the joke. Um, you know, life is very short and the universe is a wonderful place and there is so much to see and so much to experience and so much to become more intelligent about. And the only way you can do it is to have your personal, however modest, your personal experience of various phenomena, various happenings and various events. And, you know, telling about something, you know, this is a meta comment about something, instead of doing the actual thing is the worst way to approach science. Yeah? And I'm not going to tell anybody about this and deprive them of the pleasure of seeing the phenomenon themselves. If you want to, this is a kind of a replacement um, substitute. You can Google my name and the number file. There are lots of videos that I put out online, thanks to number file, of various phenomena and the really magical effects of those curious objects and so on, and you can watch this. However, even that is only a substitute. There's nothing that replaces your own touch, trying things yourself, and indeed noticing curiosities in, in nature yourself. So, okay, watching videos is much better than a stupid person like me telling you about this. So that's really the worst possible way to, way to proceed. But even watching videos is no good. You should really try those things yourselves and if they indeed discover some things yourself. And there's so much, so much out there. And let me add something that I didn't say last time. People say, well, discovering things is difficult and, you know, extracting science from everyday life and, uh, you know, mundane in facts and so on, that requires talent and special aptitude and so on. I, I believe that's wrong for the following reason. It, the reason presupposes a certain belief and outlook on, on the universe. My outlook is, well, you know, people say, well, I don't like science. That's fair enough. Some people don't like science. And, oh, I like science, but, you know, I get tired after a while. You know, I can't continue for so long. That's very, very reasonable. Or, you know, I try very, very hard, but I can't get through some difficulties. Well, what, what's more human than that? Sure. But it's true that however um, fragile and however sort of weak humans are, there's actually one shall I say, creature, anthropomorphically speaking, creature who keeps practicing in science very, very successfully, in fact, with 100% success, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with no stop, yeah? and has been doing it for ages and ages, and everywhere you go, and that's nature herself. Nature is doing everything in perfect harmony, and in fact, wherever you see, and whichever you look, there is some phenomenon that's happening, and there are thousands and tens of thousands of laws of nature that are being satisfied at the same time. Yeah? And many of those laws of nature are not are yet unknown to humans. But it's amazing how coordinated nature is. It's working all the time. So even when you are fed up and when you close your books and you, your professor leaves the room and you go into vacation time and your internet is down and so on, you think that science stops existing and it stops existing for humans. But nature keeps going. 
The other side of the, this uh, observation is that, therefore, whichever you look, as I said, and whatever you listen to, and wherever you cast your mind to, um, you know, in that part of the universe that you are observing, nature is doing something. So nothing is easier than to discover than to discover than, than than science because science is happening all around you. It's just a matter of opening up your mind a little bit and making a little bit of effort and have indeed you have to have an eye for surprises. But humans are born to be surprised, you know, programmed by mother mother nature to be curious about things. So you just pay attention and pause and then you relax. And especially you shouldn't worry about what other people think and what your social standing is. If you are interested in something, it's interesting. And if you are not interested in something, it's not interesting. But you should just uh, keep looking. And everywhere you look, um, you reach out you, with your right arm, you reach out your left arm, you stick out your left foot and right foot. Everywhere you, you reach, there's a bit of science in there. And so you just, uh, you just meet science all over the place. It's very easy. So starting your career as an artist, and then going on to philology, and then coming into mathematics, obviously is not the standard path mm -hmm. into science that most people in the career yeah. do. But I think that it gives you a very different perspective from a lot of people who have taken that more traditional path. Is there any lessons that you've learned along that way that has changed your approach to science. I should mention one thing. Maybe not everyone knows the word philology. People used to know this, but it means the love of languages, but more specifically, the study of languages. Um, some people call it linguistics, but the nuance is quite different. Linguistics, since especially Chomsky and that school, became very kind of analytical and almost mathematical and so on. I'm absolutely not interested in the universal grammar or, um, you know, analytical study of languages. I, I, well, absolutely not. I'm a mathematician, and if I wanted to do some, that kind of thing, I'll do just mathematics, straight mathematics. Um, instead, the philology, um, in the glory days of the 19th century, meant primarily the reconstruction of um, the Indo-European family. So people knew lots and lots of languages and their peculiarities and their sort of accidental dis um, evolution in Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and, and that kind of thing. And of course, it was practiced outside this uh, Indo-European family for its notably Semitic family, especially languages that have a lot of written records that go way back. Um, you can do science. Um, so that's what philology means, and that's what I used to do. Um, but I do emphasize that I'm not at all, absolutely not interested in mathematical aspects of linguistics. I'm interested in the languages themselves, and I still am. Okay, that's the explanation of philology. Well, what about the unusual background? Okay, you say unusual background, but I do believe that the unusualness or usualness is in, in some sense the eyes of the beholder, or to be precise, of the external beholder. What I mean is, um, you know, it's a bit to try to say, but every human life is, is unique, especially seen from the inside. Yeah? It might look like a boring, you know, um, uh, doldrums and the you know, standard kind of path to somebody else, but for each individual, you know, that person is living only once, and there are unique experiences and, you know, the unique experiences that are not replaceable by anything else. And so... I'm not sure that my experience is qualitatively different from other people's experience in that way. I mean, people, you know, struggle through various difficulties and have moments of joy and moments of discovery. And sometimes, you know, they get fed up and they want to leave and then sometimes they come back and so on and so on. Okay, so I don't think it's that different. Um, and I, the reason I'm telling this is people should realize that their experience is a unique and it's, it's interesting if you make it interesting. I mean, if you decide that, oh, I'm a boring person, I'm a boring person, of course you become ipso facto a boring person. And to, other people will not help you. They'll say you're boring. But, you know, you, know you, you live only once. And you, you have, I'm sure that there's all, lots going on in your brain that the rest of the world cannot see naturally. And you should cherish it. And that's, that's unique. But the one lesson that I drew from coming in from perhaps uh, lots and lots of detours, well, I'm not going to tell you any lesson because I think it's up, uh, up to you to discover. But let me kind of describe the, um, the other side of the coin. So clearly I started doing mathematics seriously quite late in life because I used to do something else. And that had interesting consequences. Um, and 
again, I'm sorry to keep doing this, but I'm not going to describe those consequences, but let me describe the other side of the coin of the other side of the coin, which sounds like the initial side of the coin. Um, you know, most people in mathematics came into mathematics early. They say, well, typically, you know, in your teens, maybe age 13, 14, 15, you get really interested in mathematics and you start doing it. And the important point I'm going to raise, and something that that is for all of you to think about, is that the pro- phenomenon of child prodigy exists, as far as I can see, only in music and in mathematics. It's very difficult to think of child prodigies in other fields of human endeavor. For example, it's absolutely, it's clearly ridiculous to think about child prodigy in history, right? I mean, no, of course, no such thing exists. Or indeed, in even in sports, I think the only kind of sport where the only sport where child prodigies exist can be argued exist is gymnastics. But that's that's not quite the same because now there's gymnastics for various reasons, not all of, all of them desirable. Uh, started lowering the age. That means that you know young children perform very, very well. But when they grow up, they stop being able to perform because of various physical reasons. So, but, so that's not really a child prodigy um, phenomenon. It's just saying that the optimal age is low. And the child prodigy should mean, for example, like violinists and so on, that a child can do something that adult performers who are also professionals can do, and even sometimes better, and that's amazing, and so on. And those child prodigies can continue to grow, and then, you know, when they become adults, they are also very competent performers and so on. I use the word performer. That's because I think child prodigies exist primarily um, as performers, and the mathematical equivalent is problem solvers, rather than theory builders, and the music equivalent would be composers. It's true that Mozart was a child prodigy in composition, but on the whole, I think uh, performers and problem solvers are the dominant types of child prodigy. And it's interesting, I think, that uh, this phenomenon of child prodigy exists only in music and in mathematics, and correspondingly, people tend to come in quite early into music and mathematics. So it's a very interesting phenomenon to describe, which I th- would appear to suggest that these abilities to decode mm. the structures behind music and mathematics mm. might be innate in us, mm. or at least an evolved trait. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. So I, I have no idea. Um, it, one thing that is true, however, is that innate or not innate, um, it involves a lot of training. And the uh, Child prodigies are in some sense, um, well, maybe there's such a thing as talent, yeah? But um, one necessary condition for a child prodigy to exist is the, um, shall I say, the pers- temperament that could, st- that could bear with long, long, long hours of enormous amounts of training. And sometimes it becomes an obsession. Oh, by the way, in case somebody is going to raise an objection. Yes, yes, I'm aware that the child prodigies exist in chess and, you know, shogi. There's, in fact, a very famous shogi player, Fuji, who's a high school student now in Japan and who's beating all the masters and then go and so on. But that's, if you like, uh, um, a, a small variation on, on mathematics, right? I mean, in, in some sense. So that's, that's, uh, that's part of what I'm describing. Yeah. So... I don't know about innateness, and in fact, I'm not entirely sure about what people call talent. Um, You know, of course, I think the human brain is a very complicated machine, and it would be very surprising if there is no innate difference between one brain and another brain. After all, there are lots and lots of innate differences between one body and another body, right? But... um, it's true, I have seen lots and lots of mathematics students in, in my own field and uh, who are very talented and so on and so on by the standard uh, judgment of the society. But ultimately, it seems to me that, um, again, on the whole, I'm simplifying, but ultimately, it's really the effort and uh, how much you really like the subject that made a difference as to ultimate success. Yeah. So I'm not such a great believer in talent, Maybe I'd rather use the word temperament. You see, because I I found the... I'm digressing from your question, but that's kind of the point of this interview. I find that people talk too much about genius. 
And the, correspondingly to um, the phenomenon I mentioned of child prodigy, in music and in mathematics, they talk about genius all the time. That's a dangerous word. And I'm not sure that it's socially beneficial to talk about genius, whether it exists or not. Yeah? Uh, so I'm saying, well, maybe scientifically you can, to, uh, you can discuss the concept of genius, but it certainly does more damage sociologically than it does good. For example, it's possible to argue, and please don't, um, don't, don't shoot me, that, well, you know, of course there are wonderful musicians. Uh, let's talk about classical, Western classical music, but wonderful musicians nowadays, obviously. But they're all performers. Okay, okay, they're wonderful composers. But don't we agree that compared with the time of Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, a composition in classical music has gone down, right, on the whole? I think it's a fair assessment. I, I'm a lover of classical music, but I think that's the assessment. And it's possible to argue that the concept and the belief in genius killed classical music composition. It's extremely dis- and, and discourage, discouraging to be told, oh, you shouldn't compose unless you can be Beethoven. Because the basic, the concept of the genius is an invention of the nineteen of the German idealist idealistic philosophers. People didn't talk about genius before, and people didn't simply didn't have the concept, and it wasn't part of people's thinking. So look at, for example, Italian Baroque composers. You know, they are, they didn't care about talent or genius, but they are creating wonderful music. Just <laughs> it's just on on the spot. And, you know, they don't have to be tragic. They don't have to have a dramatic life. No, no, no. You just do it because you like it. And the same with mathematics. Um, I can say, you know, I've, I, I'm fortunate enough to be friends and personally acquainted with some of the leading mathematicians of, of our age. But I, I can say that I have never met a the genius. They were all understandable. They were wonderful, wonderful people. And they really loved what they're doing. And their, their creations really you know, um, open up a, a whole world for you and, and so on. But I, I don't think I, met a gen- I ever met a genius. Uh, so it's, anyway, in practical terms, it's much more useful to, to f- focus on other things. So that's why I'm skirting around the, your question of innate ability. Yes. Yeah. So Oist, to go on to a different track, yes. a little bit. Oist is, by definition, a very, very multicultural, multidisciplinary institution. And I'm wondering, as someone who has kind of done the opposite and sought out the world and worked in science across it, have you noticed a universality to the science that you see? Or is there like local variations? And if so, what, how does that affect the approach to science in these different places? I think it's fair first to state my um, predilection, let's say, my position um, in this kind of thing. Um, because I have lived in many countries, and and um, some of you might have heard the rumor that I, I know an insane number of languages and so on, and um, you might think I'm an internationalist, but it's the contrary. You see, just as um, many people quite, uh, quite correctly worry about di- biodiversity, I get really emotional and uh, upset about the uh, whenever linguistic diversity, in particular, and cultural diversity in general, decreases, is, is threatened. And I do believe also that the history of evolution tells us that evolution happens and you get interesting diversity and interesting life forms because of speciation. Yeah? Whenever diversity decreases and one single uh, species or single idea or single way of doing things that starts taking over, usually the world is headed for destruction. Yeah. Well, it might be because you know monkeys uh, that are that call themselves humans might do some optimization calculations uh, because in their foolishness and they say, oh, you know, we optimize this, and that means that we have to do it this way. Everyone should be behaving this way, and so on, so on. And then they end up doing this, and in some sense, um, um, uh, invention of money doomed us to go in that direction. But I do believe that that way go, um, lies madness. And in fact, for me, madness means that you abandoned uh, diversity and you started doing everyone started running in the same direction. And that's really dangerous. So I am actually a great partisan of people doing things their own cultural ways. And I don't want, for example, English to take over the entire, entire world. And 
of course, you know, people say, but unless you write in English, you don't get much readership, and then that's necessary for your tenure and for your promotion. Ah, yes, yes, we are talking about the same problem, right? Okay. So who can blame the young people for about for worrying about this kind of thing? But after I got the permanent position, I decided, and I always wanted to do this, to publish in languages other than English. It puts me in mind a little bit of some philosophy I read quite lightly, I have to admit, that said of something along the lines of that language frames our perception of reality. Do, would you think that is true for our perception of science? Does language give a certain bent to the approaches that certain people uh, Well, in, take? on a superficial level, yes. Um, in the sense that the you know different cultures, um, at least until recently, used to do science in different styles. Let's say um, in mathematics, which is supposed to be the most universal of these, um, you know, because, of course, if you do zoology or geology, things like that, which are geographically cons constrained. Different countries might do things differently, but mathematics is indeed as universal as any human endeavor can get. But nonetheless, um, if you read, a, and apart from, of course, the language in which it was written, it's a giveaway, but the Russians write mathematics in a different way, very, very different, uh, write and think mathematics in a way very different from how Americans thought and, and wrote, and then French wrote mathematics and thought mathematics in a way very different from how the Japanese did, and so on. And you can you, you could tell instantly which school, which which culture it came from, and so much better, I would say. Yeah. Another thing that I would say about language and mathematics and how it, the former frame is latter, it's a bit off the topic that you have in mind, is. Um, Pedagogical. You know, many people say, oh, mathematics is very difficult to learn, and sure it is, and it's probably one of the most difficult things that you can say. Besides, human brains are not really well ad adapted to mathematics. It's designed for doing other things. But the, um, a lot of mathematical difficulties that people encounter in mathematics are actually linguistic. Uh, for example, this is a bit too technical, but there's a definition, a um, very, very precise way of thinking about the limits and continuity and so on, um, which is, goes under the name of epsilon and delta. So for every epsilon, there exists a delta such that, and blah, blah, blah. And this is a stumbling block for almost everyone. But um, when I came into mathematics as, as an adult already, you know, have, um, I taught myself mathematics, and when I came to epsilon delta, I felt no difficulty whatsoever. In fact, I didn't even notice that it was supposed to be difficult. That's because I had been very rigorously trained in the use of languages as a linguist. And so the idea that, you know, if you change the order quantifiers, of course the meaning changes completely, it's comp it was trivial, of course. I mean, compared with the task, uh, difficult task of taking apart the syntax of, say, something, somebody like Thucydides, you know, whose sentence can continue for a page with subordinate clause upon subordinate clause. By the way, he writes really clearly, but in a complicated syntax. Well, compared with that kind of thing, the language of mathematics was very, very easy. I mean, there's nothing to it. I think the fact of the matter is most people don't have um, sufficient mastery of their native language. They never had the experience. They don't have had enough, shall I say, a bit more gently, enough um, practice of careful use of their own native language. You know, do you speak really carefully, um, making sure that you understand absolutely everything that you are saying and every word and every phrase counts? The answer is no. The people just, you know, blah, 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 just talk away. So if you have a really careful um, habit of careful use of language, I, it's my personal belief that most of the difficulties in mathematics will go away. And it's just that mathematics is an unforgiving subject where any misunderstanding, any lack of understanding shows immediately. Whereas in the rest of human endeavors, you can keep going by faking for quite a long time. So in that way, yes, the language frames how you understand mathematics. But in that very, very practical way, I think uh, the best way to improve your chance of future advancing mathematics is to practice and to improve your native language. I would say having viewed your lecture earlier today is that you're a very, very skilled science communicator. And you make your subjects very accessible and exciting for an audience. What is your kind of approach to coming up with these, your 
your communications philosophy? Again, I don't believe that I'm a good communicator, and I believe that lots of other people are simply very bad communicators. And the and the reason is I don't I don't think other people are thinking. Um, it's completely common sense. I have no intention of claiming any credit for what I do. Um, if you think this passionately, and if your agenda is not some of the things that I described earlier in the interview, but if your, if your agenda is to share surprises and to share, if possible, some of the joy and to make people understand, there are obvious things that you can do. And I'm very surprised that people are not doing it. And it's, it's absolutely obvious to anybody. Well, think of it this way. Um, you know, if you just had a very, come back, came back from a very nice trip, you know, lots of adventures and lots of wonderful experience and so on, and you are relaxing one evening, shortly after your return with your family, and you, you tell the stories. Yeah, your family are drawn in. Okay, they're on your side, and then you tell stories very well. And, you know, I can already hear, imagine hearing, you know, laughter and then clapping hands and gasps of breath and so on. Well, you're communicating very well because you have a certain agenda, and as an intelligent human being, you are communicating properly. Well, you do the same thing with science. It's not difficult at all. Absolutely not. It's, in fact, the onus is on the other side. Why are people so incompetent? Well, I can answer that question. I have answered the question a long time for myself, and I'm going to repeat myself. That's because their agenda is somewhere else. And now I'll be much gentler and, and compassionate. Who can blame them? Because the society, you know, of course, as humans, you want to live a comfortable life. You want to have some position of socially recognized position, and of course, security and all that kind of thing. And the society requires that, um, that you communicate in a certain way, which is not at all, not at all the way science um, should be communicated if your agenda is, is not uh, one of those. Yeah. What still excites you about the work that you do? Now, that's also a curious question. You probably have been um, finding it unsatisfactory that I never give a straight answer. <laughs> and the, um, I th but you see, lots of people talk about, oh, that's a common question, you know, what ex what's exciting about your work? For example, when you um, write a research grant or something like that, you're supposed to describe what's exciting about your, your project and so on. On the other hand, there are lots of things that one does which are essential, indispensable for survival, and which is foundational for everything else, about which many people never ask, well, what's exciting about it? What's exciting about breathing, for example? You, you breathe every day, every, every hour, every minute, every second, you breathe. And if you stop breathing, you are no longer. What's exciting about it? No, it's, it's not exciting, but I do breathe. And then if there's fresh air, I enjoy breathing. And if it's sort of all smoky, like as it happens in California when there are wildfires, then you don't enjoy breathing. So you're aware of breathing sometimes. It's not that you're completely unconscious, it's invisible, but you, but you don't ask that question. What's exciting about, indeed, living itself? Of course, there are you know, ups and downs. You know, there are dramas in, in life. But people don't live because it's exciting. People live because it's natural for them, because it, that's what they want to do, despite everything sometimes, or some, in some lucky cases, because of some things. Yeah? But people live because it's a basic and natural way of existing. As, as humans, as indeed biological creatures. And I would say that the scientists, when they are unhampered, unencumbered by those um, diktats of sociology, you know, where you, know, you have to publish in certain ways because you want to enhance your career, because you want to achieve some status, because you want to um, ensure you have a certain standard of living and so on. If they are doing science, well, they do science because almost they have to because they're, that's their existence. And for myself, I would say, I'm sorry to be a bit sentimental, but, but if I lost my job and, you know, I, I have to be able to live somehow, but let's say I assume that I have some kind of income and, and I, I have to move to Antarctica and live in isolation, I think after, of course, the initial uh, period of being really depressed and so forth, and uh, why, why am I stuck here and so on, I think I'll end up doing science. Because that's uh, that's who I am. What's a question, What's a question you've always wanted to be asked, but never, but never have, and what's the answer to it? 
I would say it's the it's a good question. I have the exact answer to that once. The um, the question I wanted to be asked and which I have never been asked is what is the question you have been you have been wanting to be asked but you have not been asked. Professor Tokieda, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Oist podcast. Special thanks this week to Professor Takashi Tokieda. If you enjoyed the podcast, why not let the world know about it by leaving your rating or a review. And don't forget to subscribe to be updated whenever we release a new episode. Thank you for listening and see you next time.